eh, Samuel Beckett y el lenguaje, textos y códigos visuales y como primer eh, ponente vamos a tener a Charles Clemens, que lo voy a presentar, eh, estudiante de doctorado en literatura inglesa en Tufts University, su investigación se da alrededor de temas sobre lo erótico y lo grotesco en la novela británica irlandesa del siglo XX. Eh, igual que los paneles anteriores, vamos a hablar los tres y después comentarios y preguntas. Entonces, tienes la palabra. Um, will it work? First, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for this um, fantastic, exciting experience. Um, this has been just wonderful so far, and I look forward to experiencing it without this hanging over my head for the next few days. Um, so my paper is called uh, Beckett, Giacometti, and Genet, Sensation Figure Form, and uh, this is it. There is an odd shared proximity between Samuel Beckett, Alberto Giacometti, and Jean Genet. There are, of course, biographical reasons to associate the three. Each, at various periods, knew and admired the other. Alongside their actual encounters with one another, there's also aesthetic and historical reasons to group the three. Scholars have long associated each to varying degrees with some form of post-war existentialism. Martin Esslin famously argued that Genet and Beckett both participated in the theater of the absurd, variously a parodic or lamentary response to the meaninglessness of the world while William Barrett takes Giacometti's work as expressive of the 20th century's generalized angst. While it would be misguided not to mention unproductive and dull to dispute these general historical groupings, I would here like to look in the other direction, to explore the relation between these three not through the lens of what they represent, but via consideration of their shared style. I'll be approaching this point by making the somewhat odd claim that it is through Gilles Deleuze's book on Anglo-Irish painter Francis Bacon that a shared aesthetic style can be found. In his work on Bacon, Francis Bacon, The Logic of Sensation, Deleuze moves aesthetic concerns away from issues of representation towards an understanding of the artist as constructing what he calls figures, maps of the forces that constitute the intelligibility not only of the work itself, but of the object contained therein. Giacometti's stark sculptures, Genet's hollow characters, and the formal structures of linguistic relation found throughout Beckett's work are all instances of these figures and enable us to think in a different way about the shared formal practice of these creators. At its most basic level, Deleuze's work on Bacon approaches art through the concept of sensation as opposed to perception. While perception is the experience of a rational world with distinct subjects and objects, signs and signifiers, sensation is one of a prelinguistic space of flux and non-differentiation. For Deleuze, sensation is prior to meaning. It is what hits the viewer of art or reader of writing before the form, perspective, line, shading, plot, characterization, etc., cause meaning to arise. Sensation is thus only made perceptible through form by paint on canvas applied in a certain way or by grammar, syntax, and diction. But as an experience of the unrepresentable pre-discursive, sensation works against the very form that elicits it into experience, defacing and deforming those techniques that cause it to be felt. A common example of this distinction is the way in which Cézanne foregrounds sensation in his landscapes by creating first a chaos of swir swirling color and then using line and shade to build sense out of it. Sensation can be recognized then in the appleness of Cézanne's apples, which is not reducible to their shading, shaping, or position in the field of colors on the canvas and which troubles the traditional methods of using color, line, etc. The sensation of the apples exceeds and fractures the traditional forms of representation that brought that sensation to the fore. To describe this process of bringing to light the qualities beyond representation, Deleuze creates the concept of the figure as an artistic map of the ways in which sensations are composed into various forms. This entails a reduction of preconceived meaning or narrative. Deleuze writes that, quote, we can say that sensation is that which is tr transmitted directly by avoiding the detour or the boredom of a story to be told, end quote. Bacon is a privileged subject for Deleuze because of the painter's own dedication to ridding his work of narrative basis. Deleuze quotes Bacon's claim that he wished to paint the scream more than the horror, taking this to mean that Bacon emphasized the violence of sensation itself rather than the violence of a represented subject. Yet, sensation is found not beyond or underneath form, but contiguous with it. It is, as Deleuze says, in the figure 
that the sensible form is related to sensation, form is related to content. The figure is thus a third option between realist painting and abstract expression. It is recognizable as an object, it's not purely abstract, but moves beyond representation as an attempt to show the object's imminent constitutive forces. In this way, Bacon does not draw bodies as discrete phenomenological objects, but rather demonstrates the ways in which they are brought into existence to intelligibility by illustrating the forces that make sensation perceptible within the body. The figure thus emphasizes the perpetual D and reformation, the back and forth between organization and disorganization, form and sensation, through a rhythmic sway between the formal characteristics of the artwork that function to isolate the figure and the expanding unrepresentable swell of the figure against its form. The production of figures is an aesthetic practice of reducing content to a minimum so that the constituting factors of the artistic subject come to the foreground. This entails a perpetual back and forth between form and content as the artists struggle to make manifest unrepresentable sensations with tools that are fundamentally not up to the task. This issue of representing the unrepresentable marks for me the most obvious and immediate point of relation with Beckett's search for a form to accommodate the mess and a literature of the unword Crucially, for my purposes of lassoing together these three artists, however, is that the means to accomplish this destruction of form through formal practice begins in and is, and is enabled by a profound reduction, a reduction of narrative, of historical specificity, of characterological individuation. Fundamentally, it involves a style, to borrow a word from Beckett, of lessness. To trace this style, then, I'd like to begin with the easiest leap, from painter to sculpture, Bacon to Giacometti. Perhaps the most obvious connection between these two artists can be found in the way both focused on what appear to be representations of the human figure in a period when abstraction ruled. Giacometti's sculptures, most notably the walking man and man pointing, like Bacon's tortured figures, are recognizable through their isolation on a square plane, while Bacon's spasming figures are distinguished from their monochromatic context through a use and misuse of the rules of linear perspective. Giacometti's sculptures stand vertically separate from their plinth of origin. These upright bodies are reduced to a thinness seemingly beyond humanity, begging one to wonder what force it is that keeps them upright, pointing, walking. They elicit feelings of beauty, terror, confusion, and identification without narrative origin. They are not individuals walking through either German death camps or existential left banks, though, sensation, though the sensations they provoke may take that shape as they become consciously organized. Through reducing the human form to the barest, thinnest minimum, Giacometti's figures bring to presence not only the ways in which the human form itself becomes perceptible, but how it remains upright. Genet, in his study of Alberto Giacometti, wrote, quote, Giacometti's work, work communicates the knowledge of a solitude of each being and each thing, and that this solitude is our surest glory. Giacometti's upright figures show the loneliness and bareness of the most basic of human tasks, moving forward, remaining standing. While the violence found in Bacon's puking, sneezing, shuddering subjects could not be more different from the bare solitude of Giacometti's statues, what links these two artists is the way they utilize the lessness of the figure, its reduction of content to a bare minimum, to demonstrate the ways in which the individual is in a process of becoming imperceptible, vanishing from assumed specificity into a greater process of perceptual, perpetual subjectification and desubjectification. For each artist, human life can be seen to be the result of our participation in forms that precede us, into which sensation is then formed. The process of becoming imperceptible in Giacometti and Bacon, and as I will show, Genet and Beckett, is one in which the specificity of human existence is reduced to a shared formalism. This can be seen in the shared human meatiness of Bacon's work and the solitude and resilience of Giacometti's statues. This can also be found in Jean Genet's 1958 play, The Blacks, A Clown Show. In The Blacks, Genet creates action out of the interactions of empty roles rather than full characters. It is precisely in the disappointing gap between what the audience expects, full characters interacting with the structures of French racism, and the empty types that perf perform cliched racist behaviors on stage that Genet's figures appear. On stage, black actors perform, amongst other things, the murder of a white woman, portrayed by a black actor in whiteface, to an audience, also staged, of white figures of the French establishment, judges, bishops, monarchs, who are themselves played by black actors in whiteface, Genet specifies in his preface to the play that the play is intended for white audiences, but if a white audience is not found, then one should be simulated by having a black cast member in whiteface sitting front and center in a ceremonial role. The topic of the play is the relationship between white spectatorship and black life. More specifically, it's concerned with the way in which white spectatorship creates black life through organizing and determining the formal narrative structures of black lived experience. 
When black characters act according to racist narratives while viewed by the white establishment on stage, the white establishment watching the stage from the audience becomes conscious of the way racial roles elicit presumed racist narratives. Genet has reduced the interiority of his characters to types, bringing to the surface the relation between character and audience. The act of watching the white-faced black actors on stage watch black actors perform the caricatures of French racist iconography makes transparent the fact that these are racial roles rather than essential racial characteristics and draws to the white audience's consciousness their race's agency in constructing these roles. As an artist of figures, Genet does not attempt to foreground the ways in which the body comes to be formalized, but isolates the characters on stage, bringing to light the forces that constitute their racial subjectification. By being denied subjectivity by the assumptions of an audience, both the staged audience and the seated audience watching the stage, the blacks of the play are forced to inhabit forms of subjectivity that maintain their own subjugation. The series of overlapping and co-determining relations on stage are produced by the gaze of the white audience, much as the structures of the body in Bacon's artworks are produced by the histories of representation of the body. While Bacon works to show the forces imminent in the body as non-permanent, Genet shows the way in which all individuals, regardless of race, are constituted by non-necessary pre-discursive forces of racism. While the forces shown in Bacon's figures demonstrate the fundamental indistinction of the human body, and those present in Giacometti's statues use isolation and thinness to show the resilience of human life, the rhythm of Genet's play is precisely in the back and forth between life whose content is reduced to empty stereotypes and the historical narrative formal forces that bring those types into existence. By focusing on the formalization of blackness by white society's narratives, Genet aims to disrupt the very black-white division constitutive of white domination. The play is a portrait of the portrayal of blackness in France. It's a figuration of the forces that make race perceptible in that place at that time. It thus aims not to put forward a true image of black life, a new form of representation to counter the racist, racist image, but to destroy the symbolic unity of anti-blackness through creating figures that deform those very forms of racist life. This is, as in Giacometti's sullen sculptures, a process of becoming imperceptible. Once the individual has been reduced to the degree that it can be seen as a container for forces, it is understood as open and available to new, different, more freeing forces. This pitched battle between form and content that makes up the center of the art of the figure can be seen throughout Beckett's work. In his rare direct statements on aesthetics, that he speaks directly to his quest for lessness, for logoclasm, and of the failure to represent. While in company, we are shown the ways in which the human is, in fact, to be a form slowly filled with narrative, as the unnamed narrator moves from laying in the dark to approaching something like full subjectivity. In How It Is, this technique is perfected and elevated to what can, in some respects, be called a social theory. This late novel, by showing a series of men crawling through the mud, torturing one another into language, creates figures through the process of abstraction, much like Genet's blacks. Beckett differs, however, and is in fact privileged within the canon of Deleuze's intertexts, because in his work, the relation of form and content is closer than any other. How it is, is made up nearly entirely of descriptions of the abuse of one naked old man, that one naked old man enacts on another, the former torturing the latter until he begins to narrate. The entire world of the novel is populated by pairs of naked bodies whose only differences arise from their location within a larger relational structure, whether they are torturer or tortured. These couples change constantly as each person shifts from being tortured into speech to torturing another. And yet, the situation is described as a happy one. Quote, happy time in its way, part two. We're talking of part two, with Pim, how it was. Good moments for me, we're talking of me. For him too, we're talking of him too. Happy too in his way. If existence in how it is is premised on torture, it's not a torture without its good moments. Not satisfied with showing these minor pleasures, however, Beckett refers to the structure of this subterranean world as being characterized by justice. He describes it in this way, quote, we are regulated thus, our justice wills it thus, 50,000 couples again at the same instant, the same everywhere, with the same space between them. It's mathematical, it's our justice. Given the amount of naked torture that makes up the text, justice may strike the reader as particularly out of place. Yet this is a justice that comes from structure, not individual behavior. As in Genet's work, individuals are seen to occupy forms that precede them and act according to that particular role. This relational framework itself comes into focus when a third figure, Baum, arrives in the novel and begins to torture the narrator just as the narrator had previously tortured Pym. The reader now comes to see that these narrators are each links in a series, a chain of reciprocal torture and being tortured into social existence. By dint of the constant mobility of the figures that make up the structure described in how it is, each person experiences each position. This strange justice, then, is a side effect of the very means by which subje subjectification occurs and is expressed through the very structure of the Beckettian subject. 
Each location on the chain of life in how it is appears as a figure, bringing to perception the pulsions that propel that chain and keep, to keep moving and foregrounding the forces of sensation that enable the subject's existence. This is, for Deleuze and Guattari, the, important, the import of the Beckettian subject in general. In Antioedipus, they write that, quote, the promenades of Beckett's creatures are effective realities, but where the reality of matter has abandoned all extension, just as the interior voyage has abandoned all form and quality, henceforth causing pure intensities. Beckett does not create characters, but figures, intense sensations mediated through forms whose existence precedes that of the subject who appears within them. Whereas for Genet, the individual is pushed into a subject position, showing, form, showing a form of coercively racist subjectification, for Beckett, this leads to the somewhat blackly comic justice. The narrative begins before the novel of how it is, and the narrator comes into existence as its effect, to speak it and teach it to the next in line. Justice, then, isn't the result of a world without torture, but a world where we are all tortured equally. And yet, for Deleuze, it's also the very constitution of the, Beckett the Beckettian subject as a process of becoming imperceptible that hope can be found. For the Beckettian figure, as Deleuze notes, the external and internal have lost extension and form. The subject, such as it was, has become imperceptible. Deleuze remarks on the figure in Beckett when he claims that it has no fixed identity, that it is forever decentered, defined by the states through which it passes. Quote, the subject is born of each state in a series, is continually reborn of the following state that determines it at any given moment, consuming, consummating all these states that cause him to be born and reborn, end quote. As a figure, the Beckettian subject emphasizes the reciprocal relationship between form and content, momentary subjectivity, and the subject form that precedes it. The creatures and how it is are shown to be temporary positions on an endless chain of reciprocal relations that Beckett has his de narrator describe in saying, quote, in reality, we are all one and all from the unthinkable first to the no less unthinkable last glued together in a vast imbrication of flesh without break or fissure, end quote. This imbrication of flesh harkens back to the shared meat of all life that Deleuze finds in Bacon. However, whereas Bacon's figures showed the way in which the body is constituted and deconstituted, Beckett looks more generally at structures of subjectivity. In Beckett, the rhythm of creation and destruction that the figure enables on a plane of form and content functions not only on the aesthetic level, but on the level of human subjectivity in general. The creative force of his figures show the process by which the subject becomes perceptible by showing the ways in which sensation is brought into presence by the forms of consciousness, the narratives, that we all inhabit. At, at, their most, at its most destructive, they show the subject in a process of becoming imperceptible, slipping back into the sensation out of which it emerged. Yet, the becoming imperceptible of the subject in Beckett's work, expressed through the slow breakdown of language in Worstward Ho, the slow breakdown of the body in Malloy, the destruction of received plot in Godot, or the reduction of the individual into form in how it is, also enables a kind of freedom. To fail at representing the, under, the unrepresentable, to only approximate it through showing the ways the figure destroys the very means that enable its intelligibility, Beckett opens those structures to restructuring. It's customary to speak of formalism as being bereft of any ethics, but to examine Beckett, Genet, and Giacometti from the perspective of Deleuzean figures, we can see how their emphasis on form draws forth certain ethical consequences. Giacometti's sculptures show the human shape at its most powerless, its most barely upright, while focusing the viewer on a resilience yet present, the forces that enable the lessened to sta still stand. Genet's characterless characters foreground the ways in which humans function as roles in a play written before they appeared on stage, and the manner by which racist narratives take up and limit their potential expression. In Beckett's How It Is, the justice of the framework is born precisely out of the formal equivalence of each subject. Yet the lessness of these works never function to defeat their subjects, to finally reduce them to voices in the dark, to subsume them into monochromatic planes or racist narratives. It shows, rather, that alongside the poverty of the actual, there remains an entire realm of undifferentiated sensation filled with unforeseen forces capable of creating new forms of life. For Deleuze, in fact, it is at these most extreme moments that the creative potential of existence is most visible. He claims that Beckett, and the same could be said of Giacometti and Genet, erects, quote, unbeatable figures, unbeatable in their insistence, in their presence, at the very moment where they represented horror, mutilation, prosthesis, the fall or failure. They gave life a new power of laughter that is extremely direct, end quote. In this way, these three artists I have been considering here can be associated with one another not only historically, nor through the style I've emphasized, but also through a shared dedication to hope for life in the face of terror. Thank you. Thanks.
Muchas gracias. Eh, eh, Michael Darcy. Bueno, se perdió, pero... Eh, doctorado de la Universidad de Cornell. Eh, nos va a hablar sobre... Samuel Beckett y Robert Rosenberg, Slack Realism. Tienes la palabra. Uh, so, as you'll see, I, I made a slight change to the topic uh, title of my paper. Uh, I want to begin just by uh, sort of referencing, looking back to uh, something that Nick, Nick Johnson said yesterday about transdisciplinarity as a, a Um, correct me if I'm wrong about this, Nick. <laughs> uh, um, so transdisciplinarity is, is, a, is a term which is naming uh, conditions or issues uh, that all disciplines uh, in some sense should or have to contend to, uh, like such as digitalization or climate change. One could, you know, one could sort of go on from there, but um, you know, neoliberal capitalism or something like that, um, I think what I would elect as, a, as a, you know, something that we should be contending with. Um, now, Modernism has been linked to the contemporary moment um, in, in, in numerous ways, but one of the ways um, is it's been argued that both this modern contemporary dig um, moment uh, that we see um, and modernism are both um, preoccupied with medial and sort of accelerating ch uh, pace of medial change um, and, a s and a concurrent self-consciousness about medium and media. Uh, Julian Murphy, in his book, uh, Multimedia Modernism, uh, draws the connection between modernism and uh, contemporary culture, especially contemporary digital culture, in these terms. He writes, formal reflexivity and an internalized awareness of material properties of its medium is a primary symptom in all cultural expression today of the digital colonization and remediation of the existing media currently underway. So, uh, end quote. So, modernist a formal or medial self-consciousness, its reflection on medium, reflection on language or on aesthetic forms uh, or technical supports, provides one link to the contemporary transdisciplinary uh, condition of culture. Um, within um, this sort of broad account of the contemporaneity of modernism, late modernism, by what I, I'm just taking that term to mean mid-century or post-war modernism, occupies a problematic position. Commonly, these are seen as decades that witness uh, the elaboration of what have been termed ideologies of modernism, and I'm, I'm referring in particular here to Frederick Jameson's book, um, A Singular Modernity. Uh, so by ideologies of modernism, he refers especially to, for example, the work of Greenberg or um, New Criticism. Uh, uh, Blanchot makes it into the list. Um, just threw that in there for Doug. Um, Uh, and so the point here is that this kind of represents uh, a codification of modernism um, that around mid-century or in the uh, post-war period uh, um, that d doesn't, doesn't actually uh, res correspond to actual modernism um, of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, by the codification, I'm just referring to, to notions like aesthetic autonomy, Um, the notion of a of a of a increasing uh, turn to abstraction involving specialization and purification of art forms. Um, so, th um, so that you find this sort of impulse in uh, Clement Greenberg's writing on um, on abstract expressionism, for example. Um, new criticism gets uh, grouped um, into this into this direction of, of post-war um, um, so ideal uh, post-war ideologies of, of modernism. Um, so, on this account, I just want to add, um, and I'm just referring to Jameson here, late modernism is led away from narrative, and this actually links back to the, to the first paper. Um, for Greenberg, this would be, narrative would be an intrusion on the specialization and purification of wor uh, work which is, which is reflecting on its given form, so painting cannot really, should, should avoid narrative because on Greenberg's account, painting should be concerned with the specific properties of painting, such as mainly flatness and um, what, what Greenberg calls optical experience. Um, now, Beckett 
to turn to Beckett, um, Beckett has, seen, um, has been seen to fit into this moment of late modernism. Uh, writing about uh, Waiting for Godot and Endgame, uh, Frederick Jameson uh, writes, quote, that Beck these works preclude um, allegorical events just as surely as they evade subjective expression and anything that could be psychologically interpreted. This di that dimension spells out in advance the operations necessary for the construction of an autonomous work, the pure repetitive loop from which content is decisively excluded. So Beckett takes part in this movement towards abstraction, um, a, um, an elimination of content um, in, um, in, in post-war late modernism. Now, the larger project um, that I'm working on, uh, which this paper is in some sense a sort of a synopsis of, um, is to provide an alternative to this understanding of late modernism. Amongst, so, so, and I'm referring to a book that I'm writing right now called Modernist Naivete. Um, amongst other things, uh, the notion of naivete, um, as I'm developing it, um, names an impulse to transcend forms. Um, and I'm just understanding forms here in, in quite large terms, like language, uh, narrative, or aesthetic forms, for example. Um, to transcend such forms and reach after some kind of content. Um, so one of the sort of principal theorists of late modernist aesthetic naivete, um, who is important for my project, is Theod Theodore Adorno. Um, and, and so he, the notion of naivete transverses his work in, in his writings about philosophy, in his writings about fiction, in his writings about music. Um, he describes epic naivete, for example, which for him characterizes not just the work of Homer, and you know, convention, you know, things that are conventionally thought of as epics, but, but also uh, 19th century literature, fiction, and poetry, and uh, as well as some 20th century literature. So he writes about epic naivete as involving um, an attempt of language, and he's talking about modern language, not, not the language of, um, of myth, but um, the language of the, of the 19th and 20th century, an attempt of language to, quote, carry its defining intention to the extreme and allow what is real to emerge in pure form, undistorted by the violence of classificatory ordering. That's one way that he describes epic naivete. So this naive attempt to escape classificatory ordering or the mediation of the conceptual um, is seen to be impossible in the work of Adorno, um, but still necessary. Um, to put it in other terms, thought cannot escape from its structures, um, for example, philosophical conceptuality, but this kind of naivete is still intrinsic to the survival of philosophy um, on Adorno's account. He writes this in Negative Dialectics, quote, a faith as always subject to question that philosophy would still be possible, that the concept could leapfrog the concept, the preparatory stages and the final touches, and thereby reach the non-conceptual, um, is indispensable to philosophy and therein lies something of the naivete which nails, which, which nails it, which ails it. Um, so naivete then is something that, that actually is necessary for philosophy to continue at a certain point, um, just as naivete becomes intrinsic to Adorno's thinking about um, um, literary language, especially uh, narrative language. Um, just um, to, to speak about narrative language in Adorno a little bit um, further, given the, the topic of my paper, uh, realism. Um, Adorno is normally understood as somebody who is opposed to realism um, and, and a proponent of modernism and the abstraction of modernism, for example. Um, but um, in his writings on the novel, um, what you find is actually a, a somewhat unexpected thing if you one is just working with a kind of cliched version of Adorno in that um, he's actually quite interested in realism um, and um, in, in the work of Balzac, for example. Um, what he sees in Balzac is um, a, a turn to a naive use of language, by, by which he just simply means that l Balzac is using language to try to get at some kind of sensory immediacy. Um, and this actually becomes a, um, um, a sort of a rescue mission in the work of Balzac and in the work of Adorno um, in the wake of uh, the, the problem of the, I of the abstraction of Enlightenment systems like Marxism, for example. So um, it's a strange little twist in Adorno that is kind of unexpected, uh, perhaps, in that novelistic language comes to the rescue of, of Marxism. Um, he writes this um, in his uh, essay, uh, Reading Balzac, quote, sometimes the compensatory fantasies of the naive man are more accurate about the world than the realist that Balzac is credited with being. Um, 
it is as though with every sentence of his pen, he were constructing a bridge into the unknown. Um, I think, I just would maybe as a parenthesis say, I, I think w one of the things that's happening here is, is like the scenario of representational failure is not seen to be adequate. You, like Adorno doesn't want to stay with that. Um, I think pr probably because simply to do that would be simply to fall into a, a kind of posture that's very congruent with the, the condition of late capitalism. Like it's actually not particularly subversive to stick with the condition of representational failure. Um, something, another step beyond that is necessary um, for Adorno, and that, that, that n one of the names for that step beyond representational failure is, um, is naivete. Now, um, the w w a term here that, uh, that becomes important for Adorno's reading of Balzac is derived realism. It's a kind of, it's a realism at a moment when you realize that realism is no longer actually possible. Um, and it's not possible just because of a kind of increasing abstraction of society that you witness in the, in the 19th and then the 20th century. Um, I'm kind of, um, you know, I'm talking in a kind of shorthand here, I realize at, at that point. Um, so derived realism, though, gets at what I'm understanding by naivete. Um, and that's just that it's not just a kind of regression. It's not just, oh, let's just be realist, even though, um, you know, you're not supposed to be realist. It's a kind of self-conscious um, turn to realism. Um, where you realize that it's impossible or, or obsolete as a form, but it still becomes a, a really central impulse in the survival of Enlightenment thinking and in the survival of philosophy as well. Um, so just to make clear the distinction here then um, from the received view of late modernism um, that with, w with which I began, and, and the, the, I'm just taking um, Frederick Jameson's uh, book, The Singularity of Modernity, as my reference point here. Um, so Adorno, as a late modernist, um, is not just focus on form or aesthetic autonomy or a kind of voiding of aesthetic content to the exclusion, in other words, to the exclusion of content. Um, and we're not dealing here with a cordoning off of the aesthetic from the logic of mass culture or reified society um, in Adorno, um, I despite a kind of common understanding of his work in those terms. Um, Adorno writes in the aesthetic theory, quote, art is modern when, by its mode of experience and is the expression of a crisis of experience, it absorbs what industrialization has developed under the given relations of production. Um, so just, I just, you know, obviously it's a long discussion and I'm not really doing justice to it, but uh, it's not really correct um, to, to sort of see Adorno as invested in an ideal of, of art as somehow removed from the, the, uh, the rest of culture. Um, to come back, to come then to Beckett and Rauschenberg, um, I would say to begin with Beckett that I would argue that, that the way I'm uh, framing our epic naivete um, here um, and the way that Adorno understands it, um, I think we see Beckett already engaging in this idea um, in his 1929 essay on Joyce, um, Dante Bruno um, Vico Joyce, um, and it's in particular in the way that he uses Vico to discuss what Joyce is doing um, in his um, work in progress, which then would become Finnegan's Wake. Here's what, what Beckett writes about, um, about Vico, but he's also implicitly um, writing this about the work of Joyce at this point. Um, myth, according to Vico, is neither an allegorical expression of gener general philosophical axioms, nor a derivative from particular peoples, nor yet the work of isolated poets, but an historical statement of fact, of actual contemporary phenomena, um, actual in the sense that they were created out of necessity by primitive minds and firmly believed, end quote. So that's from Beckett's early um, writing on Joyce from 1929. So as an Adorno, there's an impulse here to transcend abstraction, um, whether you understand that abstraction is allegory or forms of enlightenment thought, um, to see language as necessarily connected to reference, um, to, to its reference, and not, um, not, not to see language in, in terms of the arbitrary impositions of a subjective uh, meaning. Um, so my point here, just to be clear, is not that Beckett or Adorno are simply anti-modernist or anti-enlightenment, uh, you know, reverting to some kind of pre-modernist naivete. Um, the commonality is that they recognize that um, ref received forms of thought are unavoidable, and by, say, by that I just mean, for example, philosophical conceptuality in the, in the, in the case of Adorno or in the case of Beckett. Uh, for my, what I'm interested in is his interest in forms of 19th century French narration, like that especially traverse French narrative um, tradition, like um, the simple past verb tense, for example, um, the use of the third person, um, and um, so sort of classic uh, components of the, the of the 19th century realist fiction of Balzac, for example. Um, Beckett's work 
um, when he starts writing in French in the 40s and then into the 50s, um, s indicates that you cannot get away from these received narrative forms, um, even as he undermines them um, in, in his fiction. So um, I'll just read this from um, his work, um, The Commative, um, a short story that he wrote in 1946, one of his first writings in French. Uh, the narrator of this work says, I couldn't get up at the first attempt. Um, I speak as though it all happened yesterday. Yesterday, indeed, is recent, but not enough. For what I tell this evening is passing this evening at this passing hour. And here's the point I would emphasize. I'll tell my story in the past, nonetheless, as though it were a myth or an old fable. Um, now, I'm not going to read the French version of this, which was the first version that Beckett wrote. Um, the French version is actually more relevant to my argument. Um, Beckett is using the simple past tense here, which is, a, is sort of the literary tense par excellence in the French tradition. It's not in, in French, in fr French in France, it's not spoken. Um, uh, but, um, and he, but, he, he, but he's also obviously denigrating this form, um, undermining it. Um, and in the French version of the quote that I just read, um, there's a sort of continuation uh, that does not find its way into the English quote, um, which is, ah, je vous en foutrai des temps, salaud de votre temps, um, which um, I think it means something like, go fuck yourself with your tenses, um, uh, along those lines. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, what I would emphasize here, just to put this in context, uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, a precedent here to not use the simple past in literary language at the time that Beckett was writing. And so I'm just speaking here of existentialist fiction like Camus, um, L'Etranger, for example, which completely avoids the simple past and uses uh, verb tenses of spoken language. So um, the, the impulse of that existentialist fiction was to bring literary language closer to actual experience and the, the language of actual experience. But Beckett doesn't do that. He actually is kind of more conservative and traditional in his choice. Uh, now, um, you know, it reminds you of the end of, of um, I think it's Endgame, uh, the old questions, the old answers. You know, he's like, there's this kind of n almost a sort of formal nostalgia um, uh, that, that, Beckett, that Beckett is engaging in here. Um, to put this in other terms, um, Beckett is sort of maintaining a literary frame for his work, um, a distance um, between the work and the world that is established by the conventional form, the, p the simple past that he is using. Um, this conventional form is the sign of the literary institution. Um, I'm just referring here to Roland Barthes um, writing Degree Zero um, in making that comment. Um, I would actually compare this aspect of Beckett's work to Adorno's impulse to stay with idealist philosophy like he Hegelian dialectics, for example, um, and its central um, operations like the mediation of the conceptual rather than what Adorno does not do is he does not pursue the, the path, for example, of existentialist phenomenology, um, which, you know, would sort of to bring language into a more concrete form. Um, you know, Adorno, uh, as most people who read Adorno would know, um, just, you know, had a, um, you know, had a hate on for Heidegger. Uh, so, um, but at the same time, obviously it's important to say that Beckett is undermining the, f the literary language, um, the simple past and its forms that he is using. Um, in the trilogy, the counterpart to this undermining of narrative forms, especially the past tense, uh, the use of the third person, or even things like characters, con you know, literary conventions, um, is a promise that is attached to the narrator's account of his contemporary situation in the present tense. Um, so this is getting at this scenario of the naive attempt to transcend forms. Um, for example, um, in, um, in Malone Dies, the, the account of the narrator's situation in the present um, is seen to involve, quote, the possibility of something like a true statement at last. So this possibility of a true statement is that which lies beyond the literary forms that Beckett is, um, is using nonetheless, even though he's denigrating them. Um, and as the trilogy progresses, we get a movement towards the present time of enunciation and the first person. Um, and so the, no the novels are gradually um, moved towards a gr an elimination of received uh, literary conventions. Um, skip that. Um, um, it's, it's in The Unnameable um, where uh, the narrator says this. Um, 
Assume henceforth that the thing said and the thing heard have a common source. Situate the source in me without specifying where exactly. No finicking. Anything is preferable to the consciousness of third parties. Um, and, th and then he goes on to talk about um, the idea of um, a beginning and an end. Um, I just read this quote as a sort of, let's move away from narrative temporality and move away from characters with third parties. But of course, finicking <laughs> is exactly what Beckett does, is in the sense that he kind of announces the ambition to move away from these conventions, but then hesitates and still lapses into using the convention. Um, I would say that it's just this uncomfortable strat uh, straddling between in 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 inhabiting aesthetic forms or literary forms and the impulse to transcend them um, that I want to, it's that straddling that I want to capture with the notion of modernist naivete that um, I would argue we see both in Adorno and Beckett. So to come then to Rauschenberg um, and visual art, um, I think at one level, Rauschenberg might seem like a strange person to bring in here to, to sort of um, add to this argument about modernist naivete. Um, and um, because uh, if modernist naivete involves a recognition that you have to inhabit received forms, philosophical forms or literary forms, um, a lot of Rauschenberg's work for which he is most famous actually seems kind of Dadaist and it was received as a sort of neo-Dada um, um, strand of post-war art. Um, so, hopefully this will work. Like this is one of his, perhaps one of his, uh, perhaps his most well-known work, or one of his well-known works, mon uh, Monogram from the 1950s. Um, this is just composed of found object. Um, um, he found that sheep just on the streets. Uh, well, actually, I think he bought it from somebody, um, um, a taxidermist in New York. Um, there, there are a number of other um, sort of uh, just sort of found um, things um, um, that, that are that are um, mashed together. Um, Rauschenberg's name for this kind of work uh, was combine, um, and um, so um, th and th so this this was seen to look back to um, um, different kind of neo uh, earlier data like um, Kurt Schwitters, for example. Um, so uh, you know, and it, if it was seen as a neo dataist mode in the 1950s, then that doesn't really look like work which consciously inhabits received literary forms because the sort of avant-garde impulse was precisely to explode those forms and, and, and you know, do without them. Um, but the point I want to emphasize is, is, is rather that Rauschenberg's work um, elsewhere, um, and more generally, I would say, retains sort of the, f the aesthetic frame and the spectatorial distance um, be between the spectator and the artwork. Um, even as he reconceives of the, the, pl the picture plane, the plane of the picture, um, as a work surface rather than a component or analog of a visual experience. Um, so I realize I'm going a bit quickly here, but I'm referring here to um, an influential essay on Rauschen that talks about Rauschenberg, uh, Leo Stein Steinberg, um, an essay called in Other Criteria from 1972, in which he argues that Rauschenberg's work of the 1950s makes this shift um, from um, the work to the work as a as a as a work sp surface. So it, basically, I know it's uh, I'm not really doing a great job of explaining this, but the argument here is that that sur what is normally conceived as surfaces, things that we work on um, horizontally, are placed on the wall. Um, so we move between the horizontal and the vertical. So that does two things: it unsettles the 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 notion of a um, of a picture plane, but it also retains it. And this, this is exactly the kind of um, back and forth that I'm, I'm getting at under the notion of, um, of naivete. Um, so here are some examples of this. Um, this is called bed. Um, he just put his bed on a wall and, scra and scrawled some paint over it. Uh, um, and I just love the way like pillow becomes like an aesthetic material here. Um, so, uh, okay, um, okay. Um, so just, um, I'm gonna have to uh, sort of uh, wind up pretty soon here, but um, what I wanna say here is that um, there's not really, um, so maybe I'll just skip ahead. <laughs> um, um,
Um, so basically, uh, I'll just sort of try to sum up uh, verbally. Um, I'm not gonna have time to finish what I wanted to say. Um, like basically, the, this is a picture hanging on a wall um, and Rauschenberg maintains that particular framework just as Beckett maintains the framework of literary conventions like the simple past and, and characters and the use of uh, the third person, for example. Um, so both, um, both of these uh, late modernist figures are um, not, not just sort of exploding forms or, or rejecting them, but working within them. At the same time, they're reconceiving of the forms um, and, um, and, and settling them in, in various ways. One of the ways that Beckett does this is he thinks of literary, the literary text as a pensum, because it's, a, it's also like, uh, um, it evokes the notion of the text as a, as a workspace. Um, one of the ways that Rauschenberg thinks of the text as a, the, the painting as a workspace is um, by um, thinking of literary production in terms of um, rubbing, actually, erasing, um, um, and um, or just you know rubbing um, on 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 the surf on a surface of an image to transfer it to another image, um, so I think that um, the, the, the reconceiving of the literary text as a workspace is a way to um, attempt to sort of bring the world into those forms. In other words, transcending um, the limitations of forms, um, but also retaining the forms themselves. So that's the dynamic of lit of naivete that I've been been getting at. Um, um, so, Rauschenberg framed um, his project as a, in, um, um, in certain, in, in his drawings for Dante's Inferno as a move away from abstraction and a turn to involvement with what he called symbolism, um, to reading images with reference to, quote, something already in existence. Um, this move represents a move away from Greenberg's proposition that painting should confine itself to purely optical experience. Um, so, Rauschenberg's um, work then represents a moment when modernist aesthetic purity, arts confining itself to medium specificity, um, is interrupted by a literary interference. And so there's a point of contact here with Beckett in Adorno. These late modernist projects re re resist the critical narrative of modernism becoming more abstract, less representational, as it specializes on reflection um, imminent uh, to a specific um, artistic medium. So just in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, le toca a Ricardo García, que soy yo, yo mismo, eh, doctorado en Letras por la UNAM y eh, profesor de tiempo completo en la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras y eh, el presente análisis eh, que revisaremos son algunas características estéticas en común entre Quaid 1 de Beckett y composición en rojo, azul, amarillo, negro y gris de Montreal a partir de estudios inter interdisciplinarios. Eh, el estado de la cuestión me lo voy a saltar por falta de, de, por falta de tiempo y eh, empezaremos con las exploraciones disciplinarias. Mondrian, como todo el mundo na sabe, nace en una familia calvinista en Amersoft, Holanda, a partir de 1900, y a partir de 1900 tiene una crisis religiosa y abandona la religión calvinista de sus padres y comienza su búsqueda con la literatura teosófica de Elena Petrovna Blavatsky. La teosofía busca destruir los límites de todas las religiones y observar el mundo natural con la mirada del ojo interior. Blavatsky creía que era posible alcanzar un conocimiento de la naturaleza más profunda que el obtenido por los significados empíricos. Así tenemos que el trabajo de Mondrian fue inspirado en este conocimiento espiritual. De la teosofía tomó la idea de la evolución y progreso hacia la revelación última del equilibrio y la reconciliación de las fuerzas opuestas. Mondrian ve en el arte un significado para descubrir un nuevo mundo y cuando esto suceda, el arte ya no será requerido. Por otra parte, Beckett nace en una familia anglicana, su madre es muy puritana. Beckett le dijo a Tom Driver que tuvo un sentimiento religioso en su primera comunión pero que nunca más lo obtuvo. A pesar de su agnosticismo, muestra un interés por los símbolos y rituales cristianos, los cuales menciona o utiliza en sus obras. Atraído por su desapego, invierte la estructura de su experiencia mística para explorar con la sombra, lo oscuro, lo irracional, como en la estructura de la mente de Murphy. Los trabajos de Beckett no se caracterizan por buscar una experiencia con lo divino, 
Beckett desdeña a los que creen que Godot es una alegoría de la salvación cristiana. Incluso en Ed Game, Ham declara que Dios es un bastardo y que no existe. Filosofía. El pensamiento de Mondrian y Beckett no es filosófico en estricto sentido, ya que la filosofía se basa en la capacidad de nombrar un problema e intentar clarificarlo con razonamientos sistemáticos. Mondrian, al desarrollar la abstracción geométrica, busca encontrar la estructura básica del universo, construye la retícula cósmica con el color blanco, todos los colores, atravesando por las líneas de color negro, ausencia de colores, en los planos geométricos regularmente rectangulares, pinta colores primarios, elimina las curvas expresando que el arte no debe ser figurativo, no debe implicarse en la reproducción de objetos aparentemente reales. El pensamiento de Beckett está muy lejos de su sistematización, ya que su pensamiento parte de vivir en la confusión cotidiana, la cual lo invade todo. Como en la teoría del caos, no se pretende dar sentido porque no, sea, no, se, pueda, no se puede cambiar la confusión. Beckett comenta que quiere, cito, encontrar una forma que se adapte al lío en, y esa es la tarea del artista ahora, fin de cita. La forma de que este autor encontró en la estética del fracaso, la cual parte de la ignorancia y del impedimento. La búsqueda filosófica y estética de Beckett se manifiesta a través de sus ensayos, poemas, libros de notas y obras. Algunos ejemplos de ideas filosóficas son las doctrinas del límite de Anaximandro, René Descartes en el poema Horoscope y Schopenhauer en el ensayo Proust. Por otra parte, desarrolla la literatura de la despalabra, la cual ve en el significado un obstáculo o un impedimento para llegar al objeto. A veil that must be torn apart in order to get the things behind it. Cita, fin de cita. La estética llega a los objetos o la nada detrás de ellos. El desvelamiento constante hacia la nada produce huecos en el lenguaje y una arquitectura del vacío. Con estas ideas escribe el ensayo Pinturas del impedimento. Artes visuales. Mondrian en el ensayo Dialogue over the New Building, Diálogo sobre la Nueva Plástica, publicado en Stigil en 1919, explica el nuevo arte mediante el diálogo entre los personajes A y B. Y cito a B. In painting you must try to see composition and not the representation as representation, then you will finally come to feel the subject matter a hydrants. Fin de cita. Un ejemplo del, de claro del abstracto geométrico es la composición, eh, lo puedes regresar, de composición en rojo, azul, amarillo y negro de 1922, que se encuentra en el Museo de Arte de Toledo, porque existen muchas composiciones muy parecidas, va moviendo los, los colores, pero me interesa trabajar este. Es un cuadro de 41 centímetros por 50 centímetros, donde todas las líneas, exceptuando las horizontales, sir se sirven como límites del cuadro que se extiende a través de la pintura y termina justo antes del margen del mismo, y esto hace que el plano rojo y amarillo sean claramente visibles. Los planos de colores parecen ser entidades independientes, las líneas que no llegan hasta los extremos del cuadro crean vectores como fuerzas y un efecto de contrapeso como la de un ancla. El equilibrio se mantiene entre la precisión geométrica por una parte y el toque manual por la otra. La técnica elimina lo pintoresco y no impone un sentido de algo mecánico. Los cuadros están hechos con una especie de exploración o búsqueda de las figuraciones y no obedecen a un patrón automático. En la búsqueda geométrica manual, Mondrian percibió un acercamiento a la búsqueda de Malevich y su Black Square, ya que con el método de acierto y error se llega a la figura que se plasma en el cuadro hasta que el proceso queda terminado. Artes escénicas. Beckett fue un escritor con dos pasiones, además de la palabra, la pintura y la música. El biógrafo James Lonson comenta que de acuerdo con el pintor Avigdor Arica, amigo de Beckett, el dramaturgo podía quedarse frente a una pintura durante una hora disfrutando las formas, los colores y comparándola con otras. Después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, Beckett escribió los primeros ensayos en francés, ya no sobre literatura y filosofía, sino sobre pintura, 
les peintures de Van Velde, peintres de l'empêchement, et three dialogues Samuel Beckett and George Dudry. Quaid 1 y Quaid 2, en 1982, a pesar de haberse estrenado en la televisión alemana y después en Londres, son los más claros ejemplos de la experimentación con la abstracción geométrica en movimiento en el escenario. Quaid 1 busca la esencial en el espacio, los colores, sonidos y movimientos, y podemos encontrar en la obra tres conceptos estéticos que quiero destacar. El primero es la reducción a lo esencial, que se puede observar en área escénica, que es un cuadrado de seis pasos por lado, el cuadrado tiene como vértices A, B, C y D, el centro del cuadrado es el punto E. Características en común. A. Reducción geométrica para la universalización. Mondrian maneja tres conceptos. ¿Puedes poner la siguiente? Mondrian maneja tres conceptos estéticos en esta composición similares a los utilizados en Quaid 1. El primero es la reducción de elementos para la universalización a través de elementos geométricos, como son las líneas horizontales y verticales, así como los cuadrados y rectángulos resultantes de los cruces de las líneas en el caso de la composición de Mondrian. En Quaid se forman dos cuadrados, el escenario de seis pasos y otro alrededor del centro E, por el esquema del recorrido se forman ocho triángulos. Utiliz B. Utilización de los colores primarios. Los trabajos utilizan los tres colores primarios y tres, tres tonos neutrales, negro, blanco y gris. En composición, el rectángulo rojo da la ilusión de la tercera dimensión, la perspectiva, la relación espacial del primer plano y la modelización desaparecen. En Quaid, el blanco, el amarillo, el azul y el rojo son los actores con sus túnicas en movimiento, el gris es el escenario y el negro está afuera del escenario. C. Balance dinámico. En estas obras, la técnica del minimalismo se da también en las relaciones entre los opuestos. Se utilizan para decir más con menos. Existen equilibrios dinámicos formados por relaciones de pesos y contrapesos, simétricos y asimétricos, conseguidas por la composición. En composición, el balance se mantiene entre la precisión geométrica por una parte y el toque manual por la otra. En Quaid se resalta la importancia del escenario cuadrado y el adentro y el afuera, donde se forman los patrones trazados. D. La expresión de la presencia de la ausencia. En composición existe la manifestación del equilibrio dinámico a través de la anulación del poder del centro, de donde cada elemento es importante y parte del todo. Los colores primarios están afuera del centro y al no estar rodeados de líneas negras da la sensación de continuidad y expansión fuera del marco. El cuadrado causa la percepción de tirar al ojo al, al del observador hacia el centro. Ambas percepciones buscan un equilibrio, un continuo movimiento a través de un ritmo y con esta técnica se manifiesta la presencia de la ausencia. Quaid presenta un problema con el guión original cuando los cuatro actores cruzan por el punto E el centro, porque pierden el ritmo y se crea confusión. Por esta razón se propuso que el guión de las trayectorias de los actores eviten el punto E, lo cual da por resultado otro cuadrado alrededor de este punto. Y al no cruzar por el centro, este se vacía y resalta la presencia de la ausencia, como lo propone Piet Mondrán en, la, en su composición. E. Las relaciones a través de la diferenciación. El tercero es el establecimiento de relaciones a través de la diferenciación. Mondrian busca revelar la visión de la naturaleza y la vida a través de las relaciones en la plasticidad pura y el proceso gradual de reducción. Los elementos esenciales forman líneas y color por su forma dinámica de relacion, relacionarse, son transformados en espacios, pesos, planos, de acuerdo al ordenamiento de cada composición. Quaid nos presenta diferentes transformaciones del espacio en diferentes composiciones y pesos cada vez que un actor entra o sale de la escena. F. Parte de una composición mayor ya, con, ya que no existe un final. Composición por las líneas verticales y horizontales y el marco pegado nos da la sensación de que es parte de un entramado e mayor e infinito. Las composiciones son parte del todo que nunca termina 
como una parte de la trama del universo. Quaid, por cómo empieza con el actor blanco entrando al cuadro y termina de la misma manera, nos da la sensación de que todo vuelve a comenzar, una y otra vez al infinito sin final. Otra sensación es que, esta par, es, que es parte de un todo, un ritmo visual y auditivo que se acelera conforme entran los actores y cuando están los cuadros es más pleno y acelerado y comienza a decrecer. Es como una onda que sube y baja, como una onda de luz en movimiento o el continuo de una respiración. Conclusiones. Existen ideas estéticas similares entre los dos artistas a pesar de sus diferencias en el tiempo y en sus metas. Ambos, metodológicamente, reducen progresivamente el proceso de sus trabajos hacia la reducción geométrica para la universalización. Asimismo, de igual manera utilizan colores primarios, blanco, negro y gris. En composición, la noción de interrelación es un balance dinámico entre los contrarios y en Quaid, la noción de las relaciones, se da en la estructura del texto, en los personajes binarios y en el tiempo y el espacio. De la misma manera, buscan la expresión de la presencia, de la ausencia y de las composiciones, forman parte de una composición mayor. Quaid busca una forma circular, una repetición continua, ya que la estructura no presenta un final. La obra juega constantemente con la presencia de una ausencia que nos contiene, empuja y ordena, pero que nunca la podemos conocer. Y esto es parte de la ambigüedad de toda su obra. Sus obras son intentos fracasados por conocer la ausencia, ya que se está representando lo que se impide representar. Muchas gracias. If you have any questions, any comments before we finish, comentarios a las tres ponencias, sí. Um, I'd like to first say thank you to all three papers. They were very, very stimulating papers. Um, this question is actually for Michael, um, since you, you know, gave me the possibility of using Blanchot, I'm going to bring it back to you. Um, I have a question just about the, I'm not sure if I understand the, the use of naivete here, um, both as a term and as an activity. Um, so in Anguish to Language, for example, Blanchot talks about the, that we can't use ambiguity as a means of representing ontological ambiguity, you know, that because of the intentionality involved in the action, the effort actually wouldn't be ambiguous. So the use of ambiguity actually isn't ambiguous. Isn't that the same thing with, with, with that, you, that you're flirting with here? So were you you're using naivete when it's, there's nothing naive actually about it? So I'm not really sure what the, the meaning of this is. So the term, I, I love the idea. And I love the work you're doing sounds fantastic. But I don't, I don't get the motivation for the term. And doesn't, doesn't the, the awareness of the naivete undermine the activity? Doesn't it, doesn't it, doesn't it return to a, a reflective act and therefore a, a reflective representation and therefore not the thing itself that we're talking, that you're talking about, but a reflection of the reflection of the thing itself? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, th thanks, Doug. Uh, Yeah, I, I can't really speak to the to the to the Blanchot point. I just I, I, that was more. Um, I just threw it Thank in there in my account of in my account of how Jameson was situating him. I wasn't actually endorsing necessarily a situating Blanchot. So I really, I really, um, I really can't speak to the to how Blanchot fits in. But but with regard to your to the other part of the question about um, like isn't if naivete is a strategy, then it's no longer naivete. Is that sort of yeah, yeah. one way to understand what you're saying? Yeah, um, I mean, but, but that's, I think, precisely why, like, why I'm interested in the term is, is th the a, a logicality of it or the way that it, that it frustrates that opposition, like, between, I mean, the, the really, like, the modern theorization of the term goes back to Schiller, right, and naive and sentimental poetry, and um, the sentimental, I mean, I in a way, like, you could rephrase your question by saying, isn't the naive just really the sentimental? Um, because the sentimental is, the naive for Schiller is the pre-modern, And uh, it's a little bit of a simplistic understanding of Schiller, but just I'll leave it at that. And the sentimental is the, the aspiration for naivete within a modern situation. 
Um, but I think what, what, it, what is interesting for me about it is that actually, like in a moment when you actually recognize that enlightenment becomes mythic, like in the sense that it, uh, the more we know, the more our thought becomes limited and, and dysfunctional and, and violent, then actually trying to think of forms of thought that frustrate or move beyond this opposition between the modern and the pre-modern actually becomes um, uh, um, an important project. That's really, I think, well, how I would understand the emergence of naivete, especially for, for late modernism. So it's precisely, your question gets at precisely why I think the term is important and interesting, because like, y y I think your question just subscribes to a kind of opposition between the, the, mo the pre-modern, the naive, and the, and the modern self-conscious. And, and I think what's important at a certain point is actually to think outside of that strict opposition and, um, and to recover, I and, and that's why I think the naive as a, as a paradoxical thing that looks actually not naive, but um, and more as a strategy is actually kind of an important moment. Okay. Um, that makes sense, thanks. There's another question. If we finish, we're going to eat. And the return, what time is it? a las cuatro y cuarto en este mismo lugar. Muchas gracias a todos los ponentes.